Today's webinar takes a look at the opportunities created on the Nordic level, the availability of the cultural offering in our living rooms that has suddenly become almost incredible. I know that many have enjoyed new forms of culture and made great discoveries because of being limited to their areas of their own homes. I know at least that I have. Uh, in August 2019, the Nordic prime ministers declared that their joint vision for the five Nordic countries was to become the most integrated region in the world. Culture, as we know, is by its definition a cornerstone to achieve this goal. And my God, we do need to do something about our Nordic cooperation at this time. According to the action plan, efforts will be made to promote the exchange of knowledge, skills, and contacts, as well as to strengthen cultural networks across the borders. I feel that we are at the very core of putting this vision into action today. Therefore, I'm proud that Hannah Holman has been given the honor of hosting this discussion and grateful that we have such a wide and in-depth knowledge of various cultural fields represented among the speakers today. We want also to acknowledge the support received from the Nordic Cultural Fund. Thank you for that. To conclude, I want to express my warmest appreciation to the working group that has made this event possible together with Hannah Holmen, Adam Marco Nord, Anna Kokorilo, Hans Rodel, Lise Bach Hansen. Lise, the head of programming for live talks and literature at the Royal Danish Library in Copenhagen, will be our very skilled moderator today. And I'm now pleased and delighted to give you the screen, Lise. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anwar, and uh, thank you for the speech and thank you for uh, being here, everybody. It would be wonderful if we could see your faces, if you could turn on the camera, because then we feel that we are together. Um, I'm so delighted to see you, and more than ever, I think it is so important that we meet and that we share ideas, experiences, know-hows, insights, visions. I think we are all uh, in lack of inspiration right now, and perhaps we are also a little exhausted. Um, but I think meetings like this are very important. And actually, two days ago, our Nordic cultural ministers met, and they emphasized that the importance of Nordic cooperation. So despite the tough economic uh, cuts they challenge us with, uh, so we are here and we do exactly as they say, not because they say so, but because we like to do it. And I can also uh, tell you all that you all accepted the invitation to join today. So I'm very happy for that. Thank you for being here. And I think we should also just tell you a little bit about the background for this meeting. Actually, uh, it goes back a couple of years ago when some of us came up with the idea that the Nordic cultural libraries should work closer together. We suggested at that time that we should incorporate live streaming as a tool of bringing together our audiences. And um, we did some cross Nordic live streaming uh, at the point in a big project called Arctic Imagination, which was conducted from the Royal Library where I work. And uh, it was a huge library project and um, and the, the point was that the live streaming at the time was in certain respects considered at, as being, how can I say, inferior to the uh, physical life experience. Uh, but uh, Adam Marco Noir from this uh, working group, uh, from our uh, uh, preparing working group here, he was also, also a part of, of Arctic Imagination he had this at the time wild vision of uniting cultural institutions in big common digital events such as classical concerts and talks and conferences um, and that really turned out to be uh, years ahead of its time uh, we are back in 2017 
and uh, actually only a few persons responded positively to that idea. Uh, but today, I guess while the pandemic has us isolated from one another and has made our jobs difficult, it has also pushed us into this new way of working together into a time machine of sorts. Even though we are, we were already headed in that direction in 2017, I think we can all agree that uh, our journey towards a new digital world has accelerated immensely. Uh, and maybe we have also uh, witnesses um, the democratic potential um, in, in the live streaming. And I also think that just the fact that we are able to gather this group of participants here today, 19, 90 valuable minutes in the middle of the day, it's an achievement and it's an achievement for a, it's a digital advancement. And I think we could not have done that without having prepared that for several years without this uh, possibility. So thank you for, for turning on your Zoom camera and being here. Uh, so today, the, the point about today's uh, meeting is that we are going on a journey together around in the Nordic countries. We, we start here in Helsinki, uh, or you started in Helsinki. I'm not in Helsinki, you started in Helsinki. We'll move to Iceland over Norway, uh, Copenhagen and Stockholm. And we will visit all of you participants and um, we will hear your opinions about this topic because the question remains, would the Nordic cultural sector benefit from cross national digital live co collaborations. Could we gather many digital projects across the Nordic landscape? And how can we prepare that? And how can we guide this transformation? So it will be a short a series of presentations and talks from each one of you. And um, I'm happy also for all the viewers who are here, who are participating and and, and, and I guess we are all colleagues today and, uh, and, and welcome also to you. Uh, and I, I would like to remind you, all of you that this uh, Zoom meeting is recorded. And uh, because we are so many participants with, with so many interesting point of views, I think there will be no questions actually in the end because we don't have time for that. But we have this chat function in the bottom and please go on and, and ask debate and ask each other's questions that during the talks. And I think we can actually have a very uh, a good discussion there on the site. So I really encourage you to, to participate on the chat and it will be Anna Corillo who will, um, who will uh, conduct that. But now we are going to start, um, I can see uh it looks like it's already started uh from hannah holman we are we are taking you to new york uh because we thought that would be a good point of departure for this conversation we actually called one of our colleagues over there he's called ken wine he's chief of communication uh his chief communication officer it's called at the mid and we wanted uh, you to see, uh, to meet him uh, because he and his team uh, developed an amazing project uh, during the past year. It's called the Met Unframed. It's um, a pioneering, uh, pioneering digital reproduction and a virtual experience. I have never seen anything like it. And since it's only five o'clock in the morning over there, he uh, he accepted to participate, but he sent in his his talk last night at ten o'clock. So it's quite fresh, but it's from last night. So um, I'll just give the screen to to Ken and uh, please welcome him. So good afternoon, at least here in New York City. It is. Um, my name is Ken Wine, and I'm the Chief Communications Officer at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And thanks for having me. I was asked to talk through an initiative that we had um, a few months back um, called the Meta Brain. So what I was gonna do is um, share my screen, 
we have a, a deck that has a few slides, a couple videos, a few more slides, um, and I will um, take it from there. So without further ado, I will try to share my screen, which sometimes I'm not so good at. Let's see. That should work. My colleague will shout at me if it doesn't. Um, okay, so this um, project is called the Met Unframed, and it's a partnership with the Met and Verizon. And I try to. Um, the context is important. So, of course, the Met Museum and the whole world um, shut down in mid March of. 2020, the Met had only, had never been closed for longer than three days before the pandemic. Actually, even after 9-11, then Mayor Bloomberg asked us to open the museum the day after the attacks because he wanted to send a message to New York and the world that the city was resilient. Um, of course, for the pandemic, um, we couldn't do that. So we were closed for a total of five months. And, and even when we did reopen at the end of August, we open to a very small audience. And that generally receives, we are the largest museum in the world. We are, actually last year was our 150th anniversary. Um, we have about 7 million visitors from around the world. 70% of our visitors are uh, tourists. New York City had over a million visitors from China for the first time ever in 2019. And then that is their number one destination. I share all of that to underline the point that it was you know, a paradigm we had never considered that we faced during the pandemic. So we were looking for ways that we could um, continue to do our mission work um, without um, being open or being open in such a limited way when even, even, even as I speak now, Canadians cannot come to the United States and folks from the EU and South America and China um, cannot visit. So uh, the, the mission of the Met is to is very simply to connect people to art and art to people. So how can we do that? Um, so we happen to be kind of circling around with Verizon um, in the prior year. They threw, we were brainstorming what big projects we can do. And um, for a variety of reasons, we landed on this one together. As I shared, looking at this slide, our goal was to reach audiences remotely. Their goal is um, build their brand and they have 5G, which is something they're doing a big global rollout. Fun backstory, they had made a big decision. They put 5G in every NFL football stadium um, in the country before the pandemic. So they had a challenge for themselves of, wait a minute, they had to change plans. So we are on one of many partnerships, um, projects that they did um, to continue to pursue their goal. Um, so we're trying to take our assets, which of course is our collection and their technology. That's the goal of the partnership. Um, we're going to do this in a socially distanced way. And how can we bring, bring so just quite simply, bring joy to people while they're stuck at home? Um, so it's funny, they, they came to us, their first idea, um, and you as um, communications and art people would appreciate this. They said, oh, we have a big idea when we started talking about this. We will. I can't remember the name, but they wanted to call it something where the gist of it was that people could, wait for it, steal art from the Met Museum and bring it home. And of course, as communications um, folks at an art museum, we had to say, uh, no, stealing art is um, not something um, we would feel comfortable with, but let's find another way to do it. So the idea of this project is um, that we would invite visitors into the museum to explore the Met in a three-dimensional way, virtually, via mobile device, via the mobile web, then to be able to interact with individual pieces of art using augmented reality. Then we would um, gamify the collection. We would have different sets of, um, some would be art history questions, some would be visual games, some would be kind of clues in the art, so different ways that people could inter interact. And if they answered the questions right, they could not steal, but take home, borrow a piece of art and put it in their home via augmented reality 
And then the goal was to then have these people, our individual visitors, have their own megaphone and share it on social. So come in the museum, travel around, engage with the art, unlock it, take it home, tell the world about it. That's the piece. Um, and this is kind of some of the ways we presented it. One interesting thing for us was just culturally getting our MET team um, working with a Verizon team. The Verizon folks are brilliant. They're so promotion. They're, they're so good at um, promoting to large audiences. Um, they and they really pushed us. Um, you know, our curators. They spend their. You know, we have two hundred something curators. Each one spends their entire professional life working on one narrow area of art, um, and they're not used to big marketing exaggerated terms like the future of art is here for the men like you've never seen it before of course we had to kind of um come to a mutual understanding of what terms we could would we would be comfortable with um this is a little promotional video uh, excuse me a little video that explains the game a little bit I'll, i'm going to run this and then i'll come back and talk So um, to break it down, some of the project components, what was really fun but challenging, um, our lead project manager, um, and this was a woman named um, Annie Bayless, who her day job is being our media relations um, senior director, but she kind of took this on as a fun extracurricular project. The challenge was, okay, the Met has 2 million square feet and hundreds of galleries and a collection of 1.5 million pieces. So we're not, we were not able to have all of that be online. But each one of those galleries has been curated very intentionally um, over the decade. So we, in a matter of weeks, had to choose which pieces of art we would highlight. We chose, I don't know, 50, 60 that we would kind of show in this three-dimensional way. And how would we organize them? Um, we were basically, we were basically recurating the entire collection, us communications leaders working with um, some curators. So we came up with four different themes under which we organized art. So nature and exploration and um, uh, other kind of broad topics. And within those, we highlighted both some iconic Met pieces like Washington Across the Delaware and some other um, pieces from across our collection because very important to us is the Met is an encyclopedic museum with 5, 000, over 5,000 years of art represented across seven different territorial um, departments. So last thing I'll say about that video is, um, so we decided that we are going to create these themes, pick about 50, 70 pieces, re re reconstruct them into um, kind of bespoke um, galleries. And then within each gallery, a couple, not all the pieces, we would animate. So take the Washington Cross the Delaware and add some fun things to it for augmented reality. So waves and sound, but those, all of those decisions, which pieces we did and how much fun we would have or what type of fun the Van Gogh painting would have would we have the sunflower wave in the wind, all of that we had to do in consultation between the Verizon technology people, our communications folks, and the curator of the Van Gogh or the Washington Cross and Dollar to make sure that it was kind of within the appropriate spirit of the art piece. So that was all complicated and really fun. Um, 
And here's just some social media pickup from um, the launch. Um, it was uh, really wonderfully embraced. Um, our goal here was to not go to um, traditional Met Museum visitors. It was to go um, because we're gamifying the collection, essentially, because this is you know, something anybody could access from around the world. We wanted to go as broad as we could, and we got um, lots of lots of fun comments. My, one of my favorites is this tweet on the bottom left. Want to tour the Met Museum for free in your jammies? Um, uh, we were also a little worried. Um, of course, uh, there's lots of cynicism about wait a minute, what happens when a big museum nonprofit couples with a co company like Verizon? Um, we decided we would you know take those. Um, Barbs that they came, we got a little, not a lot of that, um, you know, into which anybody asked. We said, look, the Met, we are experts on art. Verizon is our experts um, on technology. This is a great partnership. Um, here's some of the media pickup, um, which what I liked most about it is um, kind of this one on the upper left, you know, missing art museums. Um, I think it was, we happened to be, the Met was open seven days a week for the past seven years, even when we reopened. So an average day at the Met would have about eh, 12,000 visitors during the week, up to 20,000 on the weekend. When we reopened after the um, five months closure for the pandemic, we were, um, we're only open now five days a week and we had two to 3,000 visitors um, and we're not open on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. And I remember the first, this launched on a Monday, I remember Tuesday, um, my uh, colleague uh, Annie pinged me in the morning and said, you know, there are 8,000 people in the Met and Framed right now. The point is we're giving people access to something that we can't, they can't visit, um, they can't come to the museum for exception. Um, but I wanna show a little highlight you know, of some of the media which just really captures um, the project. This runs about two minutes. The Met is closing up shop after a spike in the number of cases closed and virtually empty. A reopening date has not been determined. So the new experience at the Met, which sounds pretty cool, the Met and Verizon launched the Met Unframed. You can explore the digital galleries and play games that unlock augmented reality versions of some of the museum's most famous works. The idea what art is, is ever expanding. Met Unframed is sort of hot expansion of the idea how you can engage with art. We have what we've done to the museum to make it accessible. And this gives the average person a chance to get a good poke around without going anywhere. I guess in closing, I'd say um, the lessons for us are we were very um, happy with the partnership. Um, there were a lot of things that were difficult getting our culture and Verizon's culture to use um, the same language. But the payoff was exceptionally high. I'd say our greatest challenges were internal, were to um, 
again, have our curators be comfortable with kind of some of the um, shorthand and boasting that one has to engage in if you're going to try to reach a global audience and vice versa. Our friends at Verizon, you know, they were quick to want to embrace, you know, the most iconic, noticeable um, parts of the net collection. And we had to say, well, that's great. We're happy to focus on the Temple of Dender and Washington across the Delaware, but we also want to show the full bandwidth of the Met Encyclopedia collection. Um, so here we are in May. Um, the Met is still has only we've gone from about four thousand a day to seven eight thousand visitors a day, which is still only thirty percent of what we have. We still only have about thirty percent of our visitors are tourists. You still can't come here from Canada. Um, so we are now starting to have a new conversation with Verizon about um, what we can do um, to partner together. Uh, and I guess that's a reflection of positive experience. I hope you found this helpful. Um, importantly, I hope you come and visit the Met uh, when the world opens up. Um, thanks for your time. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Ken Vine. Wonderful to have you from New York with us. He was the keynote speaker for today, so we had a little longer, little, a little more time. Uh, but I think it was very important for all of us to see what is going on over there. It's unfortunately the project is not available anymore. Uh, but um, now we know who he is, and he would also like to stay in contact with all of us. So now we go back to our region of the world. We go back to Helsinki and we, uh, where we started out. And um, our first Nordic speaker today is Marco Atisari. And uh, I'm very happy to have you with us, Marco. Uh, I will just tell everybody that you are very uh, well-known and popular uh, thinker and figure in Finland. Everybody knows who you are. <laughs> And you have worked with a lot of uh, beautiful projects. And right now, you are artistic director of the largest multi arts urban festival in the Nordic region, the Helsinki Festival, and where you are connecting culture and technology. technology. And um, I'll give you the screen, Marco. Thank you. Can you see the screen at the moment? Yes. Yep. And you can he hear my voice. Thank you very much. Uh, so happy to see many friends here also um, amongst the participants. Uh, so very briefly, th there's a funny thing that happens in the times of the pandemic when you see these large groups of people gathering, even though you know that it's a historical picture, you have this feeling like this is not safe, please stop. But this was Helsinki Festival's opening night in 2019. And uh, what I'd like to do in the next uh, five minutes or so is just to talk about one example of our uh, reacting and how, how we've uh, uh, adjusted to these challenging times and then a few uh, reflections on digitalization and Nordic collaboration. So um, first of all, in, in 2020, when like uh, many of our colleagues, we had to cancel uh, the main Helsinki festival, we still decided that we would focus on uh, not going entirely digital, but rather going uh, even more taking over the city to do urban, safe, small scale events. And those took two forms. We did courtyard concerts. So these were uh, an open call to Helsinki, like many cities, has beautiful courtyards. So they, the, uh, the buildings and um, um, associations of the the buildings could request a concert or a performance to be staged there. But the other thing we did, which I'd like to speak about is uh, what we called Art Gifts. Um, and it's partly an open source project. Uh, the, the basic idea, and you can, uh, for those of you following later, if you want any additional information, this page has all of the links and a short video describing what I will also say. Uh, I think it all started from uh, this frame of the Italian tenor uh, singing during the Italian lockdown. I think many of us saw that online. And so then we thought, can we take this and can we turn it into a system uh, that could uh, bring art to uh, the citizens of our city? 
And the basic idea was that anyone in Helsinki could order a five minute performance, um, uh, be that music, circus, uh, dance, to um, a colleague, a friend, a loved one. And uh, what the festival did is we coordinated everything. We paid for the artists. Each artist did about seven to eight uh, uh, gifts uh, per day. And what was critical is we made, made it all possible to coordinate it and uh, order them with an app, much like you would have order food for yourself with Foodora or Walt or a ride with uh, Uber or Lyft. But except here is not ordering for myself, I am ordering a gift to my friend or relative or loved one. This was all done on a web app. And um, what the application did is it, uh, we distributed these gifts all over the, the region of Helsinki. And then um, there were certain rules. One rule was you did not know which gift you uh, would arrive. So it was a surprise. Um, uh, the second was that you ordering a gift, let's say to your grandmother, uh, you would need to be present there welcoming the artists. So the infrastructure of the production was distributed and everyone, even though they got the gift for free because we as a festival paid the artists, there was a certain responsibility and if you like a se seriousness of the commitment to it. Um, the performances took place in under a balcony or in the outside of the uh, apartment building or in the courtyard, uh, as you saw in that picture. So there was a built-in corona, corona safety to that. What we decided from the very beginning was that we, uh, it doesn't make sense to do this only for one city and one weekend if you develop such a system. We did it with a studio called Counterpoint. So from the very beginning, we made it open source. Uh, this means we um, last August uh, gave away the code and the concept to all of our colleagues, many of you on this call, that you could use this if you find this concept uh, useful to you, please do it. And in November, uh, Reykjavik Arts Festival did art gifts, first for Reykjavik, which was a success, and then three weeks later for entire Iceland, uh, giving over a thousand, thousand gifts. And we're very happy about that. And also, um, I'm happy to see Anders Bayer on the line and, and Bergen Festival is also uh, doing the art gifts. So it gives us great joy that we can share, share this. And it, with each time we're learning more. There are other countries coming as well, and uh, even other municipalities in Finland are using Helsinki code. So lack of uh, nationalist competition, which is nice. Uh, so here you can find out more. Um, just a few reflections before we end on digitalization and I'll need to go quite quickly. First of all, as you can see from the art gifts, we took an approach to digital as a kind of urban infrastructure, not just art distribution. We often think about it as the way to deliver an art experience, either by a streaming or an immersive experience like the wonderful ones we saw at the Met, or then new, authentically new digital formats for work, uh, immersive ones, and those are very interesting. But we focused more on using how smartphones are changing cities, how we move around in them, uh, how, how things are delivered. Uh, so we, with art gifts, focused on this kind of use of digital as a kind of marketplace or as urban infrastructure. The second thing to note is that as important as digital distribution is, even though there's screen fatigue, we need to acknowledge that digital distribution is largely built on rented land. If we're building it with uh, on platforms like Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple, Microsoft, these are all great companies, but these are quasi-monopolistic platforms. So it, it is clear that if you build up audiences on these platforms, you may be turned off tomorrow. You never know. Third is, Sadly, we do not yet have a business model for the streamed uh, um, performance. What we do know, however, is what people pay for online today is synchronicity, the feeling that we are all there together. Arguably, that may be what people pay for in real life performances too, the feeling that we are here together experiencing this art. But this sense of synchronicity, except in gaming, is very immature still. And uh, finally, I just wanted to say, I think this is a particularly fruitful time for Nordic collaboration. In fact, the way I, I met Anders and Vigdis Jakobsdottir from the Reykjavik Festival, who have now participated together with these, using the art gifts um, uh, open source, was through a program called Platform Gout, bringing young artists together with the festival scene. And I think without that collaboration, uh, 
this other collaboration would, wouldn't have happened. So I think increasingly as artists stay in a region longer for ecological reasons as well, and with digital collaborations of these kinds, I, I feel very uh, positive about that collaboration. And uh, with that, uh, I'd like to end my comments and look forward to everyone's uh, short remarks. Thank you very much, Marco, for that positive conclusion. And um, we will actually stay in, in Helsinki with your colleague, Laura Alto. Uh, and we are going to, she is going to tell us about um, a virtual journey uh, that she uh, takes people on. Um, she knows really a lot about how uh, virtual reality technology can success successfully be used in uh, showing your beautiful capital to the world. Um, Laura Alto is CEO of Helsinki Marketing and um, she has developed uh, with her team the, the, Hel the virtual Helsinki uh, and uh, they take the audience on this these beautiful trips around the Finnish capital. Uh, and you also took the initiative to create My Helsinki and the Helsinki We Chat. Laura Alsop, please. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here and, and, and really exciting. I'm looking forward to the to the to all of the presentations and I was really insightful to hear the two first ones. And I must say that um, the art gifts uh, Marco and his team were giving to the local residents in Helsinki was uh, simply um, amazing experience at the end of last summer when um, there was a very strong feeling of hope and, you know, commitment to the, to the future that we're going to survive from this crisis. So thank you, uh, so thank you so much for inviting me to participate. Uh, I'm excited to be part of this discussion. Um, uh, I'm, so my name is Laura Alto. I'm, I'm leading Helsinki's international brand building as a CEO of Helsinki Marketing. It is, which is a, a city-owned um, kind of marketing company. Um, there's a famous quote by the former New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg saying that culture brings more capital than uh, capital brings culture and, and and one could also argue here that culture brings more digitalization than digitalization brings culture and i'm i'm arguing here that um there is a lot creativity and unconventional thinking that culture can and actually should bring to to digital transformations in various fields so um, I will briefly talk about my points of views on the digital trends in the cultural sector. And I will be talking about three points related to digital trends in cultural sector, sector in the next five minutes. First, there is the uh, community. Uh, second, there I will discuss the competence. And thirdly, I will talk about unlikely alliances. Um, and I will briefly explain what I mean by these. And actually there's a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of the same things that we've, we've heard this morning already. Uh, I won't be sharing any presentation, but I'll, I'll share with you a few links um, on the chat for further research, if you, if you like so. So first, is, there's the idea of community. Um, and in digital world, uh, we can easily bring people together. We can reach out to communities that are, that are not our heavy users. We can, we can enhance the existing communities, um, build more inclusive new communities and, and, and give them access to, to behind the scenes and, or, or show that kind of that kind of authenticity that would not, would not be possible in real life. And we can even go beyond the real and enter the, the so-called imaginary world. And I argue that many cultural institutions have not yet understood the true power of communities that lies in the digital transformation. And I'll give you an example, and this is exactly what was um, uh, presented before. Um, a year ago, when the pandemic had just recently hit the world and Helsinki was trying to figure out how to make people stay at home instead of going to parks for, for a picnic on, on, on 1st of May celebration. Uh, and we came up with an idea of organizing a virtual live concert in, in, on, on Helsinki's main square, Senate Square. 
Uh, and the concert uh, happened in real time, but the, the event was held in the virtual world. So we realized we could use the virtual Helsinki platform for the local community by inviting citizens to participate in a virtual celebration with, with, with one, one of the country's most popular artists. So the virtual Helsinki, and I'll, I'll show you link link to that one, it's a physical capitals digital twin, and it was built on using 3D modeling from, from o to open data, which was then supplied by the city, um, as well as drawings and, and, and images. And it allows the users to experience key landmarks as they choose, and, and, and it is one of the world's most realistic, realistic VR, VR experiences. So it's, it's, it's all coded. It's not built on, on 360 videos, but it's all coded based on the 3D modeling that the city is providing as, a, as an open data. So uh, what happened then? There was a, the, the virtual platform and a live uh, concert on that virtual platform. Um, uh, on 1st of May, or actually the day before that, half a million people showed up that night and altogether, altogether 1.4 million people saw, saw it online. So it created a community, a feeling of sharing something together in real life. It was digital, but at the same time, a real life uh, experience. So digitalization brings art and culture to completely new audiences, what we also heard in the previous uh, talks. Um, new communities with more detailed targeting. Just study on how e-commerce has succeeded. There are communities out there, uh, out there if your content is unique and authentic and real, something people can feel passionate about. So, so digitalization means more personalized services and more choice. My second point is competence. Uh, and there is no doubt that digital transformation needs a lot of, lot of new competencies. And um, my note is that every uh, cultural organization should increase the collective digital competence. Quite often I, you, you hear that digital transformation um, is not moving forward because there is not enough competence or not enough talent. And yes, you, you do need new people who have skills that your existing organization does not have. Um, but you must also make sure that the existing team learns new skills. And I, I, I personally think that um, the most wonderful thing about digitalization is that it's, um, it's a holistic thing. And you can, and you could and you should be also, it should, could and should be embedded in all of organizations activities. Uh, and I do realize that some, some people are suspicious and think that no technology can replace a, replace a real visit and a real encounter, which is, of course, very much true. But I think digital experiences can bring about new experiences that are impossible in real life. So it's not either or, and it's both and. And, you know, going beyond the things that can be uh, reachable and accessible in, uh, in real life. So remember to, uh, to build on the buttons. And my last point is uh, something that I, I, I like to call unlikely alliances. Uh, I am a strong believer that uh, believer of the idea that you should look for partnerships and networks beyond your own circles. Um, because when you go to territories that you're not familiar with, you put yourself in a situation where you need to rethink your existence and your activities. And I think this COVID-19 situation is, is exactly what, what this has done to, to art, arts and culture. So digitalization is a perfect platform for, for art institutions to rethink what they're doing, like we heard in the case of Met and Helsinki Festival. Um, and I'll, I'll give you a short, uh, a very brief example and show, show you a link to this one as well. Um, Helsinki is launching a new contemporary art event, Helsinki Biennial, this summer. Uh, it was supposed to take place last year, but of course, due to COVID-19, it was postponed to this year. So now, uh, in about a month, uh, on June 12th, we'll be opening the Helsinki, the first Helsinki Biennial. And as, as part of this a very local event. I mean, taking place on a, on a former military island uh, that, is, that was uh, very recently opened to the public. Uh, 
we've now put a lot of effort on um, how to make it reachable from all over the world, even though they won't be able to travel here. Uh, so the main question is how to make a very local experience into a super global experience. And, and one of our answers is uh, unlikely alliances. So teaming up with parties, um, like the, in, in the Met case, actually, uh, through whom you can reach up to audiences uh, that we couldn't reach otherwise. So we will launch a cooperation in a couple of weeks. And so unfortunately, I, I cannot talk more precisely about it yet, but uh, please um, follow, follow on what, what, the, what Helsinki Biennial is doing. And my main point here is that look beyond your normal circles, uh, especially in the terms of digital innovation. There's a lot of, crea a lot of crea creative and innovation that art and culture can, can bring to table. So to, uh, to close up my five minutes or so, my advice is to, to look at digitalization through the lenses of community, competence, and unlikely alliances. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you so much, Laura. And, and I will just um, encourage everybody to uh, ask questions on the chat. Also, if you got questions to the talks, because then speakers can answer you there. Uh, and now we'll uh, continue to Norway to Bergen, where Anna Speyer is sitting right now. Anna Speyer is uh, had before he went to Norway a glorious career in Denmark uh, in the musical classical musical field, and now he is the CEO and artistic director of uh, uh, the Bergen International Festival. And the festival was really one of um, the the places where that draw our attention last year under the lockdown and Anas could you please tell us what you did and what happened last year and and how you are working right now with your festival thank you Lisa it's so nice to be with you all and uh, thank you for the invitation it's a pleasure to be uh, with you yes uh, Lisa um, uh, from the group, I received the, the, the question uh, if the close down has had any impact on uh, on uh, our way of thinking uh, to present art and uh, and what did you do and and how did it work? Um, and I can I can assure you that it had uh, uh, immensely impact because last year around this time, five weeks prior to the festival we got a notice that we actually couldn't make the festival as planned. So we did, we canceled about 2000 artists and transformed the, 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 um, the festival into a digital, uh, uh, yeah, 60 production and broadcast quality and, uh, and, uh, and formed a digital team. Uh, so um, we had had some, some tryouts and some research uh, in the, the past years. Uh, so we were not totally starting from scratch, but we, we had to, to have a very, very, uh, um, let's say, get some experiences very fast. So, so within this very short time, we, we transfer, transformed the, 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 the festival. Um, and uh, as you indicated, um, we were quite surprised that we reached um, about 1.3 million uh, people in 122 countries. And um, so that I, we were not at all game changers by doing this, but I think that we were uh, kind of front runners uh, in a time where all the other big festivals, they closed down. So we, we used this window to, um, uh, to uh, to bring our art uh, to the um, to the audiences, so that was that was uh, a success, and uh, and then we wanted to take the um, the experiences from last year to 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 uh, to this year, and uh, hoping that we could make a hybrid festival, both with uh, serving our many uh, audiences throughout the world and then also have uh, audiences in, in, the, in the venues. At this point, right now, we can have 100 people in the audience. And with, if the opening of the society goes into phase two in Norway, we can have 200. 
So, so we can, in fact, make this hybrid uh, festival uh, that we have uh, hoped for. Um, uh, but it's, it's, it's very challenging. I mean, uh, during the last 14 days, we had to, to cancel all, uh, almost all international um, artists, such as uh, the Vienna Philharmonic and uh, uh, many ensembles from the from United States. We have an American theme this year. So, so um, it, was, it was quite uh, frustrating. And uh, at this point, we, um, we still know that we don't know if we have the full subsidy from the states. So we are, I'm, I'm, I'm awaiting uh, to, to have uh, a note uh, whether we can actually um, go forward with all the plans. So we, we might see further cancellations or reductions or postponing and so forth. So, um, so <clears throat> but we have these uh, experiences now and we have a, a, a team, we, we can make TV productions and we have uh, all, all capacities in-house to do this. Uh, and we have also tried out uh, uh, between last year and now to have um, um, tried to, to, um, um, to bring uh, five productions uh, to the Chinese market to, to, to see if we could get a foothold in China. And now we are uh, reaching the, the, the very crucial point because last year we did it for free. You cannot give art for free in the long run. That's, that's, that's totally impossible. Uh, so we, we tested out whether, whether, could we have some, just 1% uh, of the Chinese population or something that would be fantastic. So, and we also made for the cinema and so forth. Uh, uh, but the big question is to create a sustainable business model as Marco also, I think it was uh, Marco who, who, who said about this. Uh, and it's very difficult because now this year we are, you can, you can buy this, uh, our, uh, uh, digital productions. This is very challenging because some of our, of our great, um, the, the big institutions such as the, the opera and ballet in Oslo, they are giving it for free, all their productions. So you see, we need, we need a new mindset to, to uh, understand from my point of view that, that it is undermining the whole market uh, uh, if, you, if you give art for free. Um, you remember that in the media, the press in the beginning of the digitalization, they gave it, they gave it for free, and that was certainly not a good thing. And now you have to pay to, to, to get, um, to get news and so forth. Uh, so um, that is uh, that is uh, the the new challenge. And then a totally, I mean, an immense immense problem is how to negotiating rights for broadcasting now. That was not the case before, and in, in, in the same extent. So now, it's a totally new business model, and uh, and it's a totally new way of actually creating. So from having all these digital um, events that was available uh, uh, last year and also will be available now, we work more and more to create productions that from the uh, beginning are created in, in a digital format, be it uh, VR or AR. And for that matter, we work with pa partners such as the National Theatre London, who have experience with that kind of, um, of thinking, so that we more and more um, create new productions that uh, doesn't use technology as a kind of, you know, tool of spreading uh, the, the, the productions, but, but uh, actually work uh, with uh, technology as uh, um, as a forming um, decisive and the the, the, uh, the, the the first way of thinking is not uh, is in, in, in that format so um, <clears throat> and it was uh, it was really uh, interesting to hear about the Met and and the on frame project and and also what uh, uh, what uh, you do in Helsinki uh, Marco, and thank you for for sharing the art gift project with us, which we will do in our own way in Bergen. So there is this collaborative spirit, also not only in the Nordic countries but also uh, international. 
and I see that uh, this is kind of the, the good side of the pandemic is that we are forced to work more and more together. Also because these productions that we are talking about, uh, many of them are immensely expensive. So if we can share it with others, and and uh, for instance, we, we, we talked um, about making this um, um, kind of a sharing of, of productions. We're talking with the Shanghai Arts Festival who have uh, 5 million people in their audience. If you can buy a pass for 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 the Bergen uh, productions, uh, our audiences could buy access if giving us a, a little sum more than than uh, than uh, for the ticket in Bergen, they could have access to to digital productions in in Shanghai and 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 other uh, and and maybe also in the, uh, amongst our colleagues in the Nordic countries. So there's a it's, it's not easy to do, uh, to make a kind of Netflix in the cultural world, but uh, I think it's challenging. And, uh, and, uh, and I, I, I think that we, 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 we might have a bright future, perhaps. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna Speyer, and thank you for stressing the point on the lack of the business models that we are all suffering from, I think. Uh, now we will uh, go fly over to Iceland to Anna Hildur Hildbjörn, uh, Anna Hildur uh, Hildebrandsdottir. And here we go, <laughs> the volcano. Thank you, Anna. That's wonderful. That's exactly where we are right now. Yes. And, and uh, I'll just uh, pre introduce you. Meanwhile, you, we are watching this volcano. Uh, you are or you also uh, have a um, background in the music uh, field and you are also a filmmaker and uh, you're a course leader for creative industries at the university of bifrost in iceland and you have worked as program director for nomex the nordic music export and you helped build the famous jaja club nights and the nordic playlist and uh, now you are teaching at online university uh, Bifrost and you have a great interest in storytelling and, and that's also what we see in your, uh, in your career as a filmmaker. And you just, uh, uh, last year you had premiere on a, a quite famous documentary called A Song Called Hate. So please tell us about uh, that tour. Yes, I'm going to allow you to enjoy the volcano a little bit longer. I invite you on a journey to the Icelandic active volcano digitally. Look at this, distributing a volcano around the world. Um, so I actually talking about the transformation that the digital um, revolution that has really been pushed forward in this pandemic um, I was one of the first that was hit by this when the Danish borders closed, I think it was 13th of March uh, last year. And um, I was going to premiere my debut film, A Song Called Hate at Copenhagen Docks. Uh, in a space of five days, Copenhagen Docks did the miracle of turning their festival into a digital festival. I myself decided to withdraw the film in a state of shock that the world was closing and, and um, we had never seen anything like this. But um, a year later now, uh, my film has just uh, screened at Copenhagen Docks digitally. I've now had the film in 15 festivals around the world and all of them being digital festivals apart from Warsaw Festival, where I went and got COVID. So, <laughs> so this has been a, an interesting journey for somebody who's just entered the film industry and uh, seen it transforming in, in an extraordinary fast pace. And uh, as, uh, as the volcano has now decided to be quite dead, I'm going to stop this and come back to you here. Um, so of course, this has given a lot of 
food for thought, also about accessibility. Where, where were we at before the pandemic? How was the accessibility to arts? And this, this brings me to another thought process. And that is that the internet doesn't have any borders, but we're still marked by copyright borders. So in all of these festivals that my film has screened, and, and uh, the film is about the Eurovision performance of a band called Hattari, a protest band that went to Tel Aviv in 2019. Um, and they have followers around the world. Uh, it probably hasn't um, reached more than one or two percent of their followers because everywhere it's screened, it's geo-blocked. So we got still some obstacles to solve. It's the copyright issues and uh, to some degree, the language issues as well. So now that we're talking in Nordic collaboration, I think we have great opportunities to really look deep into what actually can we do to operate more as one cultural market, the Nordic market. How can we improve on some of the obstacles that we have? And that is still something that um, because of business and market reasons hasn't been solved. And um, so I think, I think we have an exciting prospect and looking at how we move forward for cultural producers, having worked both in the music industry and the film industry and being part of an online university now, I think we are um, definitely talking about that uh, distribution and production will move forward with both digital and physical outlets in mind. So I think the customer has got used to having their culture brought into the living room. And I think that demand won't go away even if we can offer physical um, events. But at the same time, we will also um, be able to, as a cultural sector, to provide more accessibility to our um, productions. And as you say from, from Bergen Festival, the productions and the creation is the most expensive part. And maybe we haven't been that good at distributing it so far, especially when it comes to physical productions. So I think this is a very exciting time to move forward and look at how can we do that better when it comes to performance arts, when it comes to everything that is created on stage, be it music performances, theater performances, opera, classical performances, etc. So these are the kind of really exciting prospects. On the other hand, it's also interesting, and that's uh, from my, with my university hat on, is to really create uh, strong research networks to look at what is actually happening, what are the possibility, and how is the digital sector affecting art forms? What are the new art forms that will come out of this? What are the new collaborations that will come out of this? And that is something that I think we can do much better um, in creating exciting and necessary Nordic research projects. And just on a, I'm going to end on a note of my favorite pet project, which is a little um, social entrepreneurial project that I do as a grandmother. Um, because I lived in the UK for 30 years, I've got two grandchildren in England and I want them to speak Icelandic. And in that little project, we have a week long course that artists run in a little fishing village in Iceland called Isafjörður with those children who are in the need of being stimulated, both immigrant children and children like my grandchildren come to this little fishing village for a week each year and they learn the language through art, through visual art and music. And now this 
pandemic has forced those people who are in charge of that project to look at how can we create an internet equivalent of this and how can we actually make this hybrid so we are not just pre-producing everything but we can both be live and produce so we can get these wonderful artists to teach our children around the world the languages that we want them to learn um, live on the internet on a weekly basis and maybe the libraries can play part in an innovation when it comes to this i'm going to end on this note thank you so much anna hildur and uh, now from music and filmmaking let's turn to the turn to the media landscape we actually have got rasmus with us today from a media house uh, he's joining us from Copenhagen, and uh, he's not only, all, he's also, I will just mention that immediately, he's also a cultural figure in, in Copenhagen because he's chair of the biggest cultural festival, uh, Golden Days. But we know him uh, most as development director uh, of the Danish national newspaper, Information. The screen is yours, Rasmus. Nice to see you here. Thank you so much, Lisa, and uh, thank you for the invitation uh, to this uh, very inspiring panel. I'm, uh, I've already uh, made a lot of notes from uh, the rest of your talks, um, but I'll jump uh, right into it and uh, start by saying that this pandemic has been a worldwide catastrophe. But uh, for newspapers, it's actually been uh, quite the opposite. Uh, most newspapers, uh, subscription newspapers, uh, edited newspapers are experiencing um, higher numbers of uh, subscribers. Our business model seems very well suited for a pandemic where you send people home. Uh, we have a product where you we even either send the uh, the paper to people right on their doorsteps uh, where they're, they're isolated or we'll uh, deliver it to them digitally every day. So basically we are we are in a place where the pandemic oddly enough has been a a, a boost of our business model um, and it's also I think um, to do with the fact that people are or have been looking for authorities and and authoritative discussions of this pandemic. And that's what a good newspaper should be able to deliver. So on that note, um, I still, we still obviously had a lot of problems uh, with the pandemic. And one of them was that normally we have a, a live event program of about a hundred events uh, during a year um, and uh, physical live events um, for our, our subscribers and also for potential subscribers um, and we've obviously cancelled all of them uh, and it took us a while to find our uh, a new format uh, to work with and uh, what I'm going to talk a little bit about is is a format we call uh, we ended up calling them uh, slow talks it started out with the uh, the US election where we decided that uh, normally I mean we had a huge plan for sending two correspondents traveling across the US and everything and that didn't work out either because of the pandemic. So we ended up doing a, um, a series of talks with American intellectuals. We had Robert Reich, we had Shoshana Subov, we had prominent uh, US intellectuals on Zoom where we did live, live events uh, for our subscribers. And uh, they were, um, for us, they felt like a big success, but looking at the numbers, they, they really weren't. Um, we had, <laughs> We had uh, we had an audience, uh, and the audience was maybe three or four times larger than we when we do physical events. But a couple of hundred uh, uh, people didn't really match the effort you have to put into setting up uh, interviews, live interviews with uh, international stars. So. All the same, we actually decided to uh, to see if we could continue this. So we've been doing this every single week. We've we've done a an interview with a prominent uh, international intellectual, and um, I think we did it because for us it felt like a way to sort of puncture the feeling of isolation uh, that this uh, national isolation that this whole pandemic has has, uh, has given us. And uh, once we decided to do it, uh, we also had to uh, figure out what would be a, uh, a suitable business model for this. Uh, and I think I think the 
previous discussion about business models are very, very important here because uh, the pandemic is going gonna, is gonna to be over eventually and, and uh, we can live with a lot of formats that are just not uh, sustainable. Um, so anyways, we looked at the, uh, the, the, the streaming uh, numbers or the, 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 uh, the audience numbers for our live events and realized that a couple of hundred uh, people in the audience, that's not gonna work. So what we tried to do was to uh, reformat and recirculate the same content but in different formats. So uh, we, we do the, uh, the, the live interview and we still do that on Zoom and you, you buy a ticket for that, uh, very cheap, but still um, then we take the sound from that and we cut it up and make it into a podcast. And, and from going from a live streaming event to podcast, we end up with around 15,000 uh, listeners to the podcast for each episode. And then we, uh, we translate the interview and print it in the newspaper the same week. So that means we service our subscribers, which is around 25,000 people. They get the same content, but on print and in Danish because the interviews are usually in English. Um, and then eventually we will, uh, after the, uh, uh, or sometime in, this, in the fall, I think, we'll turn it all into a small book series uh, where, which we will obviously also sell. Um, so there is uh, perhaps not a big uh, revenue stream in terms of money, but we've, we've uh, succeeded in reaching a far greater audience than we would uh, have if we had just made ordinary events. Um, so I think I have uh, three main points uh, or conclusions to, to round up. And one is that, um, the, the digitalization of all of this has uh, for us meant a much larger audience and a much more diversified audience. Uh, for, for the first time, we have happy subscribers in Northern Jutland and even in Greenland, because normally we service people around Copenhagen uh, because for, with our live events. And it's a, it's a big thing for us, actually. Um, we also have internationalized uh, our, our events program Basically, we now talk to uh, to uh, to uh, Thomas Piketty rather than uh, a Danish economist at the University of Aarhus, and it's just more fun, basically, to discuss the inequality with Thomas Piketty than with anyone else, I would say. Um, and um, and uh, we've also diversified it because we talk to people from all over the world now, uh, which is also a, a, a big uh, thing for us. And then I think the last and most important point is this whole reformatting thing and recirculation of the same content that, that our audience is really, really happy to get the same content in different formats. We have, uh, we have subscribers who will, who will pick up on all three uh, formats with the same content because you, you access, uh, access the, uh, the, uh, the content in different ways. But we also reach very different uh, audiences and also audiences that are uh, not necessarily our subscribers. When we, when we launch, launch the book series, we'll have um, an audience that's not uh, normally reading uh, our newspaper. So those are the three things. And looking forward in terms of, of the Nordic perspective, I think what, what we could very easily do here would be to collaborate on, on common themes that, that unite the Nordic countries um, and, and have common events. And we could very easily, because of the digital uh, element, we could, we could, for the first time in a long time, I think, uh, transgress the uh, the language barrier we could simply just subtitle the first event and then we could in each country reformat these conversations i mean if we had a, a big uh, uh, series on uh, the nordic welfare state uh, it would be very easy to make that into a book series and a podcast series and and translate it into the specific countries but started uh, in, in the Nordic countries with subtitles. Uh, I, can, I can see that work very easily. And I think one thing that we very easily forget in the Nordic uh, scenery here is that we have an enormous advantage of a very highly educated audience. And a simple thing, everybody has access to high speed internet. I mean, you, you would think that that's a common thing, but I mean, if you travel to Southern uh, Europe or even the UK, you can't uh, expect everybody to have access uh, and we we can more or less in the nordic countries and i think we owe it to ourselves to to also um, uh, 
do something about that. That would be my five cents. Thank you so much, uh, Rasmus, and also thank you for talking about the subtitling of our common Nordic language. Maybe that is the future. Um, okay, we will jump uh, from one uh, capital to another, from Copenhagen to Stockholm. We'll go to Erik Rosales, who is uh, right in the heart of Stockholm right now at the Culture House. Um, Correct. And, and uh, Eric, uh, you are the founder of the internationally acclaimed tech circus group Cirque Alfon. Yes. Uh, you have worked with a wide range of projects when it comes to digitalizations of the performing arts, and uh, you were you right you started right out in the uh, in Kulturhuse as artistic uh, director of digital creation this summer. So yeah, yeah. Eric, F full time since January, so yes. quite a uh, few months. Please. All on. right, so I'll actually start with, um, so I, I come from the artist side of the spectrum and I wanted to share a bit of knowledge and insight that I've got. And I'll start with showing this. Circus Alfon har ju liksom lite rötterna i cirkusen. You kept everybody entertained. Men istället för att vi håller på och gör volter och snubblar på bananskal eller gråter stora tårar så jobbar vi med med liksom det lite mer digitala cirkusen. That's kind of the stuff I've been behind. And one of the first questions that I got when I actually started at Kulturhuset uh, was, what is the future like? And my question to this is actually that I have no clue, but I have an idea of how to make the best possible circumstances for future to come. And I think that is giving the trust to artists and involve other artists that are not traditional uh, and traditionally hasn't been seen as artists, those who are native on like digital natives. And part of my work is to just embrace this and, and try to just give a uh, kind of insight from my point of view. So the first thing I did, which was in the inauguration of our, of Kulturhuset uh, Stadsteatern, was to bring a friend of mine uh, to do a live uh, Zoom magic show. Uh, so he was over in Los Angeles and uh, logging in was people from Stockholm having this live experience with somebody actually doing the performance in Los Angeles live. The funny part is that Ben, my friend, he, as soon as COVID struck uh, his, his um, uh, art, all, all gigs were canceled, right? So we, and in the States, you don't have this social security system. So he had to bring in money. So he jumped on to start doing Zuma magic. And December was his best month ever. He had like 12 gigs every day in four different time, time zones. But it didn't start like that, far from. Like it was a steep like hill to climb up because people weren't really, as, how, how do I pay for this? Or what, what is this? What is Zoom magic? And when we brought uh, Ben's show to Kulturhuset, it was kind of the same thing. Like Sweden, Sweden, we aren't used to go to Zoom performances. So we didn't have that many people actually logging into these uh, Zoom streams. One of the 
things that I've done this far since January was uh, two, two weeks ago in the cultural night uh, where we had like a live Zoom presentation. And it was like this hybridity. Somehow, how can we use this format that we are on right now here together? How can we make this to tell stories that weren't possible before? For me, I don't think that technology is clumsy and big and bulky as it used to be. It's not for the nerds. Everybody has great technology at their hands the whole time. So it's not, nothing, how to say, uh, exclusive anymore. And I, I have tried to find out ways to, to enhance the hybridity of a live performance over Zoom. And I'll try to kind of show this if I We'll do like this. I'm not sure if this. So basically, I've been sitting so much in front of like webcams. And one thing that I kind of have uh, understood is, is the fact that the best, the best webcam there is, is, is an iPhone. That's right. So, so basically, the whole experience that I made together with uh, Marionette Teatin was on iPhone and a Zoom meeting. Uh, and I'll see if I... Um, uh, I'll just see if this works. Yay. So, so basically, when you have an idea uh, like this, I don't know if this will actually work. Uh, but when, when you have an idea, it's rather the idea uh, then the actual technology uh, behind it, which is the hiccup, as soon as you know what to, to tell or manifestate. For, for, for example, th that's where I'm always streaming from. And um, basically, that's where I am right now. Right now. So the hybridity of having live performance and not, what can happen then? Or with this technology that I'm in front of right now, I could be a cat. Well, I'm not a cat, but, but I, well, actually I'm not. Uh, but just having these, um, what to say, tools at hand makes new ways of expressing ourselves possible. So I'll continue with my little tiny presentation. So this was over at Kulturnatten, the cultural night. I'll just put my webcam back. And I'll share a bit of insight that Ben has given me, which kind of is part of what we all have been talking about when it comes to uh, working on different platforms, having new business models. The thing is that working with uh, technology, we have a new possibility that I'm so eager to explore, which is exponentiality. So Ben has done shows where he just had one person in the crowd, right? Logging into his Zoom uh, experiences. But since it's not uh, like ticket sales, uh, the crowd can grow ex exponentially. And that's why he's doing 12 shows every day, full on December in different time zones. So the first show, he has one audience member. The second one, he has two. And it multiplies to four, the third, third uh, show he does. And we continue the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh. And after eight shows. So we have a quite good audience. Uh, we have 128 audience members. But let's say, which is incredible, let's just do eight more shows in, a, in, in an exponential matter. The 16th show will have 32,000 people. Wow. In just 16 shows, we can, with uh, technology, just reach out to so many more people. And let's just do another 16 shows. Then we have 2 billion, uh, 147 million people watching. And 
in a way that that's kind of the possibilities that Travis Scott and Marshmallow had when they did their uh, concerts in Fortnite that had so many million people watching live their performance. Lil Nas X had like 33 million people in Roblox. What if all these people just paid $1 to actually see this show? Which is a quite cheap uh, ticket, right? But just, just since there are so many people watching, yeah, you get the picture. I'll just drive this to, to insanity. So let's do 32 more shows uh, in this exponential matter. Then, then it's like 9 trillion, 223 billion, three, you see what I mean? It's just incredible in just 64 shows. So let's do one show every day and we could have this exponential crowd. I'm just interested in uh, how that could solve ticket sales problems or uh, when, when we talk about uh, subtitling, there are so many possibilities and I'm so eager to explore all these because as we said, we, we are in a pandemic, but what after the pandemic? This is just opening doors to something which we don't know where it's going. So... Uh, I just love this kind of call to action uh, finale. So I'll say um, we are here, we are gathered here around Nordic countries. So if not now, when should we do the, this kind of leap forward? And if not us, then who? And I, I'll, I'll actually stop uh, this whole thing uh, with uh, asking us uh, in the panel, how, how to say, the presenters to turn on our webcams. I, I'll just want to see as many as of us as possible. This would be much easier if, if, we, if everybody was just allowed to be in the... Yeah! Hello, Anna! I'm happy you are still with me. Uh, oh, and oh, Adam, nice! Um, Eric, I think we will have to... Uh... I, I have my one minute, right? This is after, <laughs> this is the... This is yeah. okay, everybody. We're a little behind schedule. Clap, everybody, clap, 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 wave, 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 Rasmus, wave, push, 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 push. Now take the violin, take the bow, play together with me, like this. Nice. Oh, Rasmus. <laughs> it's okay. Great. Thank you so much, Eric, and uh, I'm, I'm so happy that you didn't stop. <laughs> this was a magical, magical presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, we are a little behind schedule, but really stay on because we have two very good speakers left, Ellen Wettmark and Linda Sackickson. And then Ellen Wettmark, now it's you. We are still in Stockholm and uh, you are our next speaker. You are now a uh, direct executive director of the impressive art institution Bonnius Kunsthal. Before that, you were at the National Center of Architect and Design. And before that, you were Councillor of Cultural Affairs at the Swedish Embassy in London. Ellen, please, the screen is yours. Thank you. Um, that was an impressive act to follow. Uh, I'm sorry I'm not going to do any magic, but thank you so much, Eric, and thank you so much for inviting me. 
thanks to all the previous speakers. Um, it's always sort of hard to go on at the end of such an interesting presentation because there's so many threads you'd like to pick up from previous speakers as well. But I'm going to stick to what I sort of plan to say because I know time is tight. So um, I come into this uh, situation a bit from a slightly different perspective than probably most other people in most other art institutions because Bonnish Konsthal has actually been open more or less as one of very few institutions worldwide. We've been open more or less throughout the pandemic with some closures for rehang, but, but continuously beyond that. And I would like to stress that being open during a pandemic is nothing like being open in usual times. Um, it certainly does not resemble anything like business as usual. And the choice of staying open was also not an easy one. I want to stress that because while we as a private institution were legally allowed to stay open, uh, there's always the kind of the ethical, but also the financial choices that you have to make when you decide to, to keep your doors open. And in the end, I think for us, we have sort of rethought that decision continuously throughout this year. Uh, and every time we come to the conclusion that because we can, we should. Um, and we are not, we've not been actively pursuing visitors, but we've said that we are open, our doors are open. Uh, we do provide something other than the sort of the essential shopping and uh, the trips to the forest for those people who need and really, really want to see art. And I think we, we really do um, see that for the few attendees, the few visitors we've had, it really has been a lifeline in this weird situation we've been. So I want to stress, even though I think uh, the presentation has shown so many incredible opportunities that we have digitally, I really want to stress uh, the importance of thinking uh, in terms of both digital and physical, because there is something that's really hard to replicate in the sense of sort of coming together in a physical space. So in practical terms, it has meant that we have been keeping our doors open, have, we have had pre-booked visitors, and usually the Constala has an extensive program of uh, pedagogical activities, guided tours, talks, lectures, and all of those things have, of course, been uh, digital instead, so we haven't had uh, any kind of events or, or activities with, with more visitors than at the moment, I think we have a number of cap of eight. So um, we have really, uh, I mean, we've really made a massive leap in, term of, in terms of the digital development and we've cherished the new possibilities that the digital gives us. Um, but I would like to say that so far, our digital activities have been a window and not a room. And I want to say that that means that we've used the digital as a space to present things that mostly mimic or reproduce activities happening in a physical space. So we've had tours and conversations that really just are not made specifically for the web, even though they've only been uh, uh, streamed. And I would predict, despite all of these uh, incredible uh, examples we've heard, that when we go back to normal, that is what most cultural institutions will have, will deal with. We've all made a massive leap digitally, but we will also be sort of continuously better to produce mirror images and versions online of what is ex essentially bricks and mortar businesses. And I'm sure we're going to see gradually more and more digital, like for digital content being developed. And I would also like to stress, and I think that Eric's presentation was an example of that, uh, that we need to also let the artists lead the way in that. I think, it, I think that is, uh, I mean, we will see so many incredible examples of artists who wants to present for that digital room. And that's what we should also allow for to develop. So um, I know the time is short, but uh, I want to say also that as, as an audience, of course, we have, I mean, we've reveled in this, these exhilarating possibilities of, of access, digital access, uh, and the fact that, you know, the, both in terms of quality and accessibility, the digital uh, leap that we've made in this year has been quite staggering. And I think that um, 
knowing that you have access to the world's best art and culture from your home is just something that uh, we couldn't really have expected just a short time ago. And I want to say that the risk, of course, when we realize that local art institutions are asked to compete in a global marketplace with global brands, like, such as the Met that we heard about. I mean, I think we will see, um, there will be some challenges for smaller institutions in small countries and places like the Nordic region, if everything is accessible through a sort of a cultural Netflix why should someone choose to buy a ticket to the Värmland Opera when you have accessibility to La Scala, for example? So I think that is a challenge that we really need to, uh, to uh, take seriously and look at business models that also uh, take that into consideration, but also that we will continuously need to argue for those experiences that an institution in a local community can bring, uh, whether sort of in this mix between digital and uh, physical. So finally, on a Nordic note, um, last weekend, the Norwegian weekly magazine Morgenbladet published an article in their web uh, edition called The Best Exhibition We Won't See This Year. And in it, the author, uh, author uh, Bernard Ellefsen, he had used the catalog and the digital content from our current exhibition by Anne Butcher to review an exhibition that he hadn't seen. And the exhibition is still up until the 23rd of May, but neither the author nor I would say almost all of his audience, like his readership, will not be able to see the exhibition. Uh, and this text I thought was really beautiful. It was a sort of a lament on the fact that restrictions have made it impossible for someone to even just cross the border and see this exhibition and um, the impossibility of experiencing some things when you're not able to be there and i think this article for me was sort of both a hopeful promise on this physical digital future because uh, this our digital outreach made it possible for uh, an author in Norway to sort of dream of seeing an exhibition, but the, and the, but the digital will not necessarily replace actually seeing the work as it is. So uh, that's my final point. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ellen. And I actually forgot to tell uh, the audience and the participants that you are also currently chairperson of the Swedish Arts Grants Committee. I think that's very important to know that about you. But and now we are meeting our last speaker, but not least, that's Linda Sakrikson. And we will actually, could we say so, Linda, go back across the, the, across the Atlantic Sea once again? At yes, you just recently worked there as uh, also in culture at the um, at the uh, as a cultural counselor at the embassy of Sweden. Mm -hmm. You're in a very interesting position, I think. Uh, we don't really know that from Denmark, but you are uh, a special uh, government investigator for the restart of cultural life in Sweden. Uh, so you have been tasked to summarize the consequences of the pandemic for the cultural sector. And you're right now working on uh, that analyze. So perhaps you've been inspired during the day. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Lisa. And thank you to all brilliant speakers. I've been taking notes too and learned a lot. And I'm also happy that Eric uh, made us dance a little bit together. That's something that I'm longing for. Um, I must also take the opportunity to, to invite you all to um, a short program, 15 minute program, uh, quite the opposite of a slow talk that will start next week on Kulturhus at Stadsteatern's uh, Instagram live. Eric and me will co-host um, a couple of conversations on how the digitalization has uh, worked with and through performing arts in different ways. So we're starting at 8.15 next Thursday morning. Eric, if you have the link to that, maybe you could post it in the chat or something. But just as Lisa said, uh, I would like to, to bring us back to, uh, to New York or to US uh, again, just on a short reflection. Um, since I was working there the last five years as culture counselor to, for Sweden to the US. And uh, when, uh, 
COVID hit the world and the lockdown started, I was actually in New York where we on the 11th of March had uh, joined the opening at Brooklyn Museum together with thousands of guests uh, on a collaboration of a big show on the legendary, legendary nightclub Studio 54 with the Swedish photographer Hasse Persson. Um, the next day, the 12th of March, the streets of one of the world's busiest city were completely empty and the borders closed. And it was obvious that all of us in the function of being cultural attaches, uh, cultural counselors, really needed to rethink and reimagine what we were doing and how we were doing it. And we needed to make that change fast. And we did. Uh, quite clueless, we just started trying. And the Embassy of Sweden joined forces with uh, strong digi digital American partners like um, German Marshall Fund and the Smithsonian Museums in Washington, DC, Women and Film um, and, and other organizations and made digital talks. We also by ourselves transmitted our exhibitions of uh, fashion and photography and um, uh, visual arts from the Embassy Building House of Sweden in Washington to be put online instead. But what I wanted to mention here today was that a real key to success was, was actually that the Nordic Circle of Foreign Minish, uh, Missions started working together even closer than we had before. We had for, for years uh, coordinated different uh, events and uh, coordinated strategies and did many things together. But what we started doing um, already in March 2020 was starting to co-produce digital events, literary talks and concerts uh, together with Nordic Americans institutions around the US or Scandinavian American institutions. and. Um, we shared costs so that we could make better productions of higher quality, increase the fees to the artists involved, and of course, most of all, raise the outreach and the audiences. Talking about Eric's picture there of, of uh, the multiplication of audiences. Um, and because, you know, the sender, the host didn't matter uh, in the sense that it usually had done. Before the pandemic, the Nordic embassies um, uh, had worked together with institutions all over the US, of course, but now we, we were live streaming and, and working together with Seattle, Minneapolis, Chicago, Philadelphia, New York, and other places at the same time. And all of this was actually done in a heartbeat. And my point is that I think that there is still an enormous potential in collaborating and co-creating and co-producing and co-promoting Nordic arts and artists abroad, especially overseas. Um, and of course, also on the other, the other way around, I think we can also work together in a larger extent uh, than today to coordinate and share resources of bringing international artists to our part of the world, especially since we need to move be, to be more sustainable and conscious about travel and logistics, etc. And many of you said so wise things today, and I want to uh, give a shout out to Anna Hildur, um, who really is a trailblazer on how Nordic col collaborations can look like abroad. I had the pleasure to work with her and Nomex in Seattle a couple of years ago when we together targeted the American West Coast music industry. And I learned a lot from that. But as Lisa said today, I, I am invited to give a few comments here in my new role uh, as a chair for this government task force. And since January 2021, uh, since a few months, I have been doing over 100 interviews with artists and institutions, experts and politicians in the Swedish art sector about the effects of COVID-19 on the challenges forward and how the state can best support the arts and the entertainment sector to reactivate and to restart. 
we are supposed to present our work the last day of September. And as many of you have pointed out for over a year, uh, the sector has really suffered with harsh economic and psychological consequences. Just a few bullets for you, what we see uh, so far and think about. The politics both on national, regional and local level must of course continue to support artists and organizations in urgent need and be prepared to support them in their transi transition also into a post pandemic world. And we must of course improve the social safety net for artists and cultural workers. We must also stress the increased and sustained presence of arts and literature in schools. And we must ensure that arts and culture are taken into consideration in developing Sweden's economic strategies, urban planning, international trade, public diplomacy, and environmental strategies, to name but a few. This means to increase and encourage collaborations and partnerships also with other sectors, I think. And if there is one lesson we must learn from the pandemic, it is that the arts are es essential to our lives. Uh, there is an urgency to preserve and rebuild the sector to better meet this essential need. I think that there is a momentum right now where the arts can step in and step up and claim its place in society. What we are working on in the task force uh, that I'm leading right now, together with the arts sector, is looking at different initiatives that reach beyond pure survival. We think that it's crucial that policies and initiatives must reach for further and continued long-term development of the sector, of renewal and reconstruction and, and innovation, and of course, of relevance. Is this easy? No, of course not. And it's not easy to press all these urgent, wide and complex issues into a paper, into a report. Quite the opposite. There are huge needs, uh, there are huge expectations and huge challenges forward. And many days after hours of Zoom meetings where I'm being told um, about stories uh, and, and told about wishes and uh, much that is hoped for and asked for. On, on my darkest days, I feel sometimes like a, a, a very bad Santa Claus uh, who is collecting long wish lists from different parts of the sector. And I fear that I will make everyone uh, disappointed. But, uh, we are, of course, uh, having big ambitions with this. And I recently read a thought-provoking piece called Protective Measures by the French sociologist Bruno Latour, who was one of the first to express the opportunities in this challenging global situation. I will share it in the chat when yes. I'm, I'm ready talking Please to you so. so you yes. can all read it. Uh, so let me quote him. Uh, the first lesson the coronavirus has taught us all in the most astounding. No, the first lesson that coronavirus has taught us all is the most astounding. We have actually proven that it's possible in a few week, weeks to put an economic system on hold everywhere in the world at the same time, a system that we were told it was impossible to slow down or redirect. And a bit further, he writes, if everything has stopped, and all cards can be put on the table. They can be turned, selected, triaged, rejected forever, or indeed accelerated forwards. Now is the time for the annual stock take, when common sense asks us to start production up as quickly as possible. We have to shout back, absolutely not. The last thing to do is to repeat the exact same thing that we were doing before. And he encourages us all to take advantage of this su suspension and ask ourselves what we would not like not to see coming back. And on the other hand, what we would like to see develop. 
This pandemic has been and is truly an existential moment for all of us. And I think that these questions are necessary for all of us to ask ourselves to be able to move forward, not to only restart, but to rethink and reimagine together. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Linda. And please share the words uh, by Bruno Latour on the chat of the tech. We would love to have the link. And then I want to, to round up and, and to say thank you to everybody. Thank you have, for having joined us today. It has been deeply inspiring, I think, for me, for us, the working group, for Hannah Holm, and for all the viewers and participants, and for the circle of, of colleagues. I, and I, as I started out saying, I think we are all colleagues today, also the viewers. Um, and I think that despite of this difficult time, we're going through, we learned that there is also a lot of innovation, creativity and flexibility out there. Um, and then uh, I just want to mention that two days ago, as I started out saying uh, in the beginning of the day, our cultural ministers met and discussed priorities for the Nordic cultural budget. And once again, they agreed on the cut of 20% in the total budget, budget for cultural cooperation in the Nordic countries in the period for 2020 and 2024. And still they emphasized the importance of Nordic cooperation despite the tough economic challenges. Um, if we're going to achieve the goal of being the world's most integrated region, as Gunvar Kronman mentioned in her welcome speech, then very strong cultural exchange and conversations as we had today uh, across the borders are really we required. So thank you so much for having participated. Uh, and then as a matter of fact, I think that I, I, I stay quite optimistic actually, because I actually feel today and maybe we all felt that that in the cultural sector, there is a drive for dialogue uh, and for exchange of ideas across the Nordic borders. We want to, to have this conversation. And, uh, and I, I definitely uh, think that our audiences should benefit from our drive to work with each other. Uh, so I hope very much that we can continue this exchange, which we started today. Uh, also when we are back to normal, whatever normal is going to look like. Thank you very much for today. Thank you so much. Great work.